Good evening. 15 years ago, a comet hit the giant planet Jupiter and produced very obvious effects. And now there's been another impact on Jupiter, and we're going to talk about it. But first of all, Jupiter itself. With me, two experts, Drs. David Rothery and John Rogers. Welcome to the sky at night. Thank Hello, you, Patrick. John, can you give us a brief rundown about Jupiter? Well, Patrick, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system, a gas giant, uh, and indeed it's typical of many planets that are now being discovered in, uh, in the galaxy around other stars as well. So when we study Jupiter, we're studying the one representative that we have of a very widespread class of astronomical object. So what we see on Jupiter is basically the top of a very deep and dense atmosphere. Uh, what you see through a telescope uh, initially is dark belts and bright zones running across the disk. Uh, and those are all cloud features. And the reason they're there is because of the very powerful winds in the atmosphere. Uh, so we now know that there are jet streams running at maybe 100 miles an hour, 200 miles an hour, along the edges of all those belts and zones, which confine the cloud systems within them. Um, the zones contain great anticyclones, of which the Great Red Spot is the most familiar and the biggest. Uh, the belts contain cyclonic disturbances, and like cyclones on Earth, those tend to be the areas where you get weather systems and quite vigorous disturbances. Sometimes we see storms em erupting within the belt, sometimes for just a few days. Why is the red spot red? Well, that we still don't know, unfortunately. But we think that it may be because it is so big and therefore deep. Uh, there is a theory that red spots, particularly the great red spot, are dragging up some vapour from very deep in the atmosphere, uh, and this vapour then turns red on exposure to sunlight. There are other red spots as well. This is one of the things that we've been observing recently on Jupiter. Um, just three years ago, one of its previously white ovals, another big anticyclone, actually turned red. And the key thing about those seems to be that they are large and also they're quite long-lived. And so it may be that those are the ovals that extend deepest into the atmosphere. What about the interior of Jupiter? Well, we know that it's hot and a lot of heat comes from the interior and actually helps to drive the weather systems. There's about as much heat that comes from the interior as is received from the sun. So uh, there is certainly some convection driven from the heat from below, uh, and we think that this is one of the main reasons why there is weather on Jupiter, and indeed why disturbances appear in the atmosphere, and then ultimately the, that provides the energy that drives the winds. And uh, Dave, um, Jupiter does have a strong magnetic field. Absolutely. It has much the strongest magnetic field of, of any of the planets. But unlike the Earth, its field doesn't appear to be generated in a, a, a liquid core made largely of iron. It seems to be generated outside the centre of the planet in a, in a shell that we think is probably made of hydrogen, but hydrogen compressed to a density such that it, it behaves like a metal. The electrons are free to move around, so it's electrically conducting and the planet's rapid rotation creates a dynamo effect, and that's the seat of a very, very strong magnetic field, which is what confines the radiation belts around the planet, which makes it such a dangerous place for a spacecraft to linger. We have sent one probe into the Jupiter clouds, and that, of course, was Galileo. Yes, uh, in 1995, the Galileo probe descended on a parachute through Jupiter's clouds, and that's the only direct probe we've had of the atmosphere. And one of the things it taught us uh, was that the jet stream uh, that it descended into is much more powerful below the clouds than we've ever been able to observe on top of the clouds. John, um, what are the recent results? Well, one thing that's emerged recently from amateur observations is that there's coupling between major weather events in the two hemispheres of the planet, which is really quite unexpected, because you don't expect very much to cross the, the, the belts and the zones. But back in 2007, we observed major differences in major belts and zones. Uh, the equatorial region became very dark, another belt faded away and then came back vigorously. And this has actually established the concept of a global upheaval on Jupiter. Uh, we saw simultaneous disturbances in the north and the south. And one of the most interesting aspects of that uh, was that in the north, there was a huge eruption of brilliant white clouds moving at the fastest speed ever seen on Jupiter, running around the planet at about 300 miles an hour. And a combination of amateur and professional observations shows that this eruption of clouds, which must have been like a colossal giant thunderstorm, erupted down from a, a layer of water clouds uh, deep below the visible cloud tops, and that there must be a permanent jet stream there running faster than the usual uh, fastest currents we see on the top. Now, let's come on to the impact. Fifteen years ago, comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 hit Jupiter 
and but he had very obvious effects. I mean, you both remember that very well. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I'm sure that everyone who could observe it did at the time, because even the smallest telescopes could show the black spots that were produced by that impact. And we knew it was going to happen, because the comet had been seen, captured into orbit around Jupiter, and it was predicted to hit Jupiter um, several weeks after its discovery. So everybody was lined up, ready to watch the impacts as they happened. A great deal was deduced about the nature of the comet, uh, and it's now known that each of the fragments that hit Jupiter were just a few hundred metres across, the largest no more than a kilometre across. Now, of course, we have this new impact. Yes, this was discovered quite unexpectedly on July the 19th by Anthony Wesley, who is uh, an expert amateur astronomer in Australia, and he saw this intensely dark little spot in the South Polar region where there had been nothing there two days before. In fact, we now know from looking at observations from other parts of the world that the impact had happened in the previous seven hours, and so it must have happened on the dark side of the planet, uh, and Anthony caught it just as it was coming around over the horizon on its first passage. What size was this thing that hit Jupiter? It was probably just a few hundred metres across, equivalent to one of the mid-sized uh, SL9 impacts. But do we know what the dark stuff is that all these impacts distribute into the atmosphere? Well, basically, it's a kind of smoke. Uh, it seems to be carbonaceous compounds that are deposited on top of the atmosphere by the initial explosion. So this is something we learned in the SL9 impacts back in 1994, that when the comet approaches, it comes in at extremely high speed, plunges down through the atmosphere, and explodes down under the visible cloud tops. Uh, and that explosion then throws up an enormous great plume, 3,000 kilometers high. That was actually imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope at several impacts uh, in 1994. And then as the plume splashes back onto the top of the atmosphere, the combination of the explosion and this super hot splashback incinerate all the molecules in the comet and in the atmosphere, and what comes out of it is a kind of carbonaceous smoke which is drifting on top of the stratosphere. Well, I wonder. We hope to give you some views from the telescopes in my observatory tonight. And outside, we have uh, Pete Lawrence, um, electronic imaging, and Paul Abel, who depends more upon drawing. Let's go and see how they're getting on. Now, without doubt, the real star of the show at the moment is the planet Jupiter. And the reason for this is simply that the planet gets to the highest point it can in the sky in the hours running up to midnight throughout September. Now, don't get too excited about this because it's still quite low down for us. But where the planet has been high in the sky for the southern hemisphere and low in the sky for the northern hemisphere, that balance is now starting to shift. And it's getting higher in our sky and lower in theirs. Now, the planet is very easy to find. If you go out in the hours running up to midnight, look due south, scan along the southern part of the horizon, and the brightest dot you can see, quite low down, is Jupiter. It looks intensely bright, but is very easy to see. Now, it may look fantastic with the naked eye, but put a pair of binoculars on it, and you'll see it's got four tiny pinpricks of light around it. Those are the four largest moons of Jupiter, the so-called Galilean moons. But things really start to get exciting when you turn a telescope on it. <laughs> oh, Peter, it's not looking very good, is it? That looks awful, doesn't it? I mean, it's total cloud cover at the moment, which is a real shame. But that's what astronomy is all about. Proper astronomy, waiting for the clouds to clear. <laughs> <laughs> now, if it does clear, you're going to be looking at Jupiter through this fantastic 12-and-a-half-inch telescope. Out of all of them here, Peter, do you know, this is my favourite one. Why? Well, it is the one Patrick mapped the moon with, and it has so much of character. Of course. So what you're going to be doing is looking at Jupiter, but you're also going to be recording it, but you're not going to be using any of the newfangled stuff uh, which I'd use at no, all. No, I'm not doing it your way, I'm doing it the proper way. OK. And it just so happens I have a drawing here that I made of Jupiter on Monday the 13th of July. Through this, this telescope? With this very telescope. Oh, that's fantastic. It's the amount bad. of detail you've got there is incredible. So how would you go about making a sketch like that? Well, first of all, I take one of these, which is Jupiter blank. The first thing I do is use my pencils. I put in the darker belt, so southern equatorial belt. Northern. So are these special pencils, or they're just normal? I do it all on the cheap, Peter. These, <laughs> <laughs> these are normal pencils. Uh, yeah, it only costs a couple of quid. I tend to use the 4B for the belts. Uh, so soft pencils you're soft using pencils. to draw the features on there. And then uh, 5B for the poles and just smudge it in to get that lovely dusky effect. Right, OK. So how long would it normally take you to complete a sketch? Oh, I'd like it to take hours in practice. It may not take any longer than 16 minutes because of Jupiter's rapid rotation, so I try to get it done in about 15 minutes. That's interesting, actually, because with a, when you're taking an image of Jupiter, you've got two minutes. 
If you go longer than two minutes, you get motion blur. So you've got a little bit longer to sort of play with that. Uh, mine's harder work. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to leave you to it. It doesn't look great at all, but right, I'm going to go and have a look at my telescope and see if I can get myself set up as well. OK, I'll see you later. See you later. Well, against all odds, even though there were really thick clouds earlier on, I have actually managed to see Jupiter, only for a brief moment of time. But the planet did come out, the clouds thinned enough for me to see it, and I did actually get it through the telescope. But not for long enough to really take or capture an image of it. Because what Paul is doing, Paul is using sketch pad and pencil...